Just a couple of thank yous, a quick couple of things here. Uh, we want to thank the Royal Choir for helping us out today and everybody that helped set everything up today. We'll talk more about that over at the school after a bit, but uh, one other thing about the service here too, we'll be using Klingaboodles during the offering. And if you don't know what that is, you'll find out. <laughs> after the service then, uh, we'll just go on over to the school and find your seats and we'll get everybody get a seat and then we will uh, I didn't know it was going to be on camera. <laughs> You'll find your seat and then we'll say a prayer and then we'll be releasing the tables in order so we have no chaos. The confirmation classes, they're going to be helping carrying trays and stuff so if you need some help, don't be afraid to ask them for any kind of help to do anything. A free will offering is going to be taken during the, the uh, meal and uh, things like that. And one other thing, if you've seen a small boy walking around here with a basket with two fish and five loaves of bread, we might need him a little bit later over at the school. <laughs> oh, if you would all please stand and face this direction. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and therefore by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We'd like to invite Pastor Dennis, uh, Pastor Meyer forward. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and attend us, a gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Most high God, whom the heavens cannot contain, we give you thanks for the gifts of those who have built this house of prayer to your glory. We praise you for the fellowship of those who by their use have made it holy. And we pray that all who seek you here may find you and be filled with your joy and peace through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
let us attend to the word of God. A reading from the book of Kings, the first book, the eighth chapter. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, you shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. And listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place, and listen in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. This is the word of the Lord. We will pray responsively from Psalm 84. Alleluia. The Lord is risen, as he said unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Hearken, O God of Jacob. For one day in your courts is better than a thousand in my own room, and to stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk with integrity. Lord, <laughs> Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Alleluia. The, the Lord is risen, as he said unto you. Alleluia. Alleluia. A reading from the letter of St. Peter, the first letter, the second chapter. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, 
and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Forward. Come on up here, guys. Come on up. You guys want to take a seat on the steps there? Come on, come on. Oh. Well, good morning, guys. Are we doing all right this morning? Are we happy to be celebrating. What are we celebrating today? What's, what's what all the, the big to do that we've got going on today? What's going on? Yeah. Yeah, the 150th anniversary. Right now, so what is, the, it's the 150th anniversary of what? Jesus! Not Jesus, that's a, <laughs> that's a good Sunday school answer, but, but, but in this case, not, not quite, yeah? The church, right? The, the, the founding of this church, the, the establishment of this congregation. Now, why do you think we would want to celebrate something like that? Why would we celebrate? Because, uh, because of Jesus. That's exactly right. That's a good job, right? We celebrate 150 years of sticking with Christ, right? Now, uh, Russell's got some, some gifts for you guys here. Uh, what, what, what's this thing here? What is this, do you think? The church. Well, you, you got the picture of the church on there? Yeah, it's a magnet. Now, what does a magnet do? It sticks to your fridge. It's, it sticks to your fridge, sticks to metal. So, now, now if, I, if I stick this, Magnet here. Oh, I'm giving a little feedback there. Moving around too much, apparently. If I stick that magnet here, is that going to stay right there? On this wood back? No, it doesn't stick there, does it? How about, how about if I stick it here? I stick it here. Is it going to stick there? No, it's not going to stick there. How about if I stick it to your head? You think it's going to stick there? No. Where's it going to stick? Well, you think it'll stick on that metal? Yeah, it sticks there, doesn't it? And look here, we got a little piece of metal right here. And it sticks right hey, there. Pastor Andy, can you bring it upside down? Nah, no, I'm opening it upside down right now. But. All right, so it sticks to the metal, right? A magnet is made to stick to metal. It sticks to the thing it's supposed to stick to, okay. not a whole bunch of other stuff, here. right? Yeah. Yeah? yeah, well, that part is metal too, right? Well, in the same way, when God made you his own, he made you to stick to something. He made you to stick to him. 
to stick to Christ, to stick to the gospel, right? The promise that your sins are forgiven, that you belong to him, that you inherit eternal life. And when we celebrate this 150 years, we are celebrating 150 years of people doing that, sticking to Christ, sticking to that promise. Yeah. So where's, so who's the big magnet and where's the little piece of the metal? Well, and so that's the other thing, right? So when you stick to the thing you're supposed to stick to, you stick to the gospel, Take that magnet off there for me. Now that was pretty easy to take that off, right? But when you stick to Christ, we just heard in that gospel lesson, right? That when you are his, no one can snatch you out of his hand, right? Well, the same way if you were, if this was, if you were the magnet, right, and you were really sticking to Christ, nobody would be able to peel you off, right? Because he's got a hold of you, right? And that's the thing, right? Nobody can take you out of Christ's hand. He has you forever, right? Does that make sense? All right. So, we've got some, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we've got, got some magnets for everybody. So if you all want to come grab a magnet. And... <laughs> Somebody want this one? There you go. <laughs> Did you get a magnet? Huh? You got one? All right, good. Thank you guys for coming up. All right, Henry, why don't you head back to your
Our mission is clear that the world should know Christ. Emmanuel, God with us, be our guide. And I could say amen, and we could go on with our next song, right? I mean, that's the story of the church. That's the mission we have in Christ. That's the gospel message. Jesus became one of us, Emmanuel, in our world. Our vision, our mission for the world is to go out and make his name known. What a wonderful joy this is to be here today with you on this 150th anniversary celebration. I, uh, I have to say, I don't want it to go to their heads, but I was very impressed by this, the choirs. Huh? I mean, from, wasn't that wonderful? The Flatville and Royal Choirs. <clears throat> And that was just, just tremendous. And uh, to be able to be here, I, uh, I'm Dan Sobo. I don't know if I've, I haven't met all of you, of course, but uh, great to be here. I'm Bishop for the North American Lutheran Church. I came in yesterday. We had a Saturday service in, is it Luther Lounge? Is that where you, yeah, Luther Lounge and in Deers Hall. And you get a lot of history just sort of walking around this place, even in the sanctuary. It's just tremendous with the, I'd love to hear the stories about some of these stained glass windows, right? And what's up here in the, in the front, and I mean, all kinds of things, uh, just ter- tremendous, a beautiful sanctuary. And I have to, I have to say, I, I wish I could take this pulpit everywhere I went. I mean, it's just, it's <laughs> tremendous. You, you walk up, you close the door, get in here, and it just, it makes you feel more important and impressive than you really are. But it's, uh, but it's really, that's really nice. And I, I have to also say, I, I, as I looked up and saw the people up in the, in the, the loft up here, um, you have a clock in the back, I don't know if that's so they start on time or end on time or if it's for the preacher. I don't know what it, I don't know what it is. Uh, but <clears throat> anyway, just wonderful to be here. I, I don't believe this is my first time here, and I could be mistaken, but I, I believe I was here maybe 10 years ago, was it, for a gathering of, uh, with Pastor Lehman, we had a gathering of some of the mission district deans of the North American Lutheran Church, and I was there, it was a smaller group of us, and uh, so I was here, but not on a, on a Sunday morning, and certainly not for a celebration like this. So my first time here on a Sunday and first time in worship, and uh, as a result, I'm going to share a little bit, if it's all right, a little bit about my own, uh, my own history and background, some of the things going on in the North American Lutheran Church, and from there, then we'll go on to into our message. So uh, before accepting the call to serve as bishop in 2019, I served two congregations, uh, both in Northern California, one in uh, a town just south of Sacramento, a town called Elk Grove. We were there for about eight years, and then 25 years down in San Jose, California, about an hour south of San Francisco. And it's where we served there. Again, you know, was where I thought my ministry was going to finish up. But, but now I was, I was elected to this role. My wife Mary and I are now living in Dallas, Texas. Uh, it's where the NALC is setting up a rather modest central office. There are five of us in that office right now, perhaps two or three more in the next uh, year or two or so. It's also where many of the meetings we have with our elected leaders, Executive Council, Board of Regents. Uh, Pastor Lehman is on the Board of Regents, by the way, and uh, so they come to us, which is sort of nice. We don't have to travel always all the time out to those meetings, so it really works out well. And my wife, Mary, to her credit, has been very supportive of the transition and the need for relocation. She understands the reason for the changes, doing everything she can to help support me in my role. She's also keeping uh, Southwest Airlines in business. <laughs> uh, she's flying back from Dallas to San Jose, where uh, not only our four children live with their spouses, but more importantly, uh, where are now, are now seven, soon to be eight grandchildren live as well. So, uh, and they're all five years of age and younger. So can you imagine that kind of energy when we all get together? In fact, the last flight she took was from, da- from Dallas to San Jose. She purchased a one-way ticket. <laughs> she, she promised me she was going to come back. Uh, she just didn't give me a date as to when. So I still know I'm in her top ten. I, I'm not sure where. Probably depends on the day where I, where I stand. In the, in the North American Lutheran Church, just a few highlights. We, we are working hard to stay in alignment in our priorities with the core values we set from the start back in 2010, uh, Christ-centered, mission-driven, traditionally grounded, and congregationally focused. We're really working hard to keep those things right in front of us all the way through. And it was very evident last year at our, our, our every other year mission convocation we gathered in Oklahoma City. And we were challenged in that gathering as the name of the mission convocation suggests, challenged to be carrying out our mission locally in our communities, domestically throughout North America, as well as partnering with some of the connections we have with our, our global workers. I was also encouraged by the spirit of that gathering. Our unity in Christ was evident, as was the purpose around which we are called to go into the world and make disciples. 
We're now in our 14th year as a denomination. We joke about it sometimes saying we're, now we're teenagers, but we truly, we literally are, we are growing up. We have 501 congregations in our fellowship. I think when Emmanuel joined, it was probably 17, 18, 19, something like that right at the beginning, and we continue to grow. God has been blessing that in tremendous ways. We have mission starts so throughout North America in the works. We also have our sending agencies expanding the number of global workers we have, missionaries who are going out on, in the name of Christ on our behalf. Two years ago, we had nine global workers. Today, we have 21. So God is certainly blessing those efforts in some great ways. In our seminary network, there are great things happening as well, as our administrative headquarters is at Trinity in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, and now we have campuses on six other seminary, six other seminary campuses throughout, the, throughout North America as well, so a lot of good things happening. Uh, we continue to grow in terms of number of students. The last report I heard was we have 48 students who are studying for, uh, to become clergy in the NALC, some of them in person, many of them online, with a growing list of, ma of men and women discerning the call to ordain ministry. And those are numbers we haven't seen for some time, so it's very encouraging to see that happening. I also want to say that I'd be remiss this morning if I failed to acknowledge the support that you as a congregation have been giving to us in the North American Lutheran Church not only in your annual giving to, uh, you know, in, in, in annual involvement in some of our events and things, but also through your financial support, uh, the annual gifts you give to our, to our denomination, as well as the very generous gift you've given, gifts you've given to our Today, Tomorrow, and Forever initiative. I wanna, on behalf of the North American Lutheran Church, uh, thank you for your generosity. As far as your anniversary is concerned, and then we'll get into the message here in a moment, um, this is obviously a big weekend for each of you and for this faith community. A lot of history in this place, many memories and, and, and are tied to the events of the past 150 years. I'd also imagine for many of you, there's also a lot of emotion, especially in looking back, connected to those various times and, and memories and events. Go down the list of the important and significant and God-honoring events that have taken place. How many baptisms have happened in those 150 years? How many confirmations have since the time this congregation first started? How many weddings? How many anniversaries? How many, how many church council meetings? <laughs> how, many, how many Sunday morning worship, worship services? How many Sunday school classes? How many potlucks? How many hospital visits, pastoral calls on members? How many funeral services? How many lives touched and changed and lived in Christ that are now eternally in the kingdom as a result? Without knowing much of the detail of your past history and the people involved in what's happened over the years, I am convinced, if not certain, that such has been the case for you. Not every congregation reaches this milestone. Not every congregation makes it to 150 years. There's good reason today to be proud and to celebrate that history. At the same time, I think it's fair to say that you haven't and you couldn't and you would not even have tried, let alone been able to do it on your own. It happens only by the grace of God. It happens only through the power of the Holy Spirit. It happens only when a long list of people, all of whom have been called and chosen and claimed by the living Christ, work together for his purposes and his glory. Once again, on behalf of the North American Lutheran Church, congratulations on 150 years. And thank you for your ministry, for your faithful witness, for your ongoing support, and for your openness and willingness to be used by God to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day of worship for the celebration of 150 years of ministry and for the celebration of the heritage that is ours in Christ. Open our hearts to sense your presence, open our ears to hear your voice, and open our minds that we might be transformed by the one who came to save. In his name we pray, amen. Turn back the clock a few years. I'd reached that point in my life before I took on this role to, be, uh, to serve as bishop, where it was soon time for me to make a visit to one of the branch offices of the Social Security Administration. 
I was getting close to that point in my life where I was about to effect a radical change in my relationship with this, with this agency of the United States government. Instead of me paying them, it was getting time for them to begin paying me. Now, truth be told, I was actually looking forward to it. <laughs> I would have, it would have been a welcome change. But then this new role came along, which I was also welcomed, and so that impending visit was put on hold. I'm actually glad it, that it was, because I didn't know at the time how I was ever going to convince them that I'm actually quite a bit older than I look. All right? That's a joke, right? All right. Now, <laughs> after eight years in this role, I'm sure they're going to have no trouble <laughs> believing me when that time comes. Well, many of you, I imagine, are either on the giving or receiving end of Social Security. Most Americans are. It was a program that, that began in the mid-1930s, not long after the Great Depression. It now appears to be somewhat embedded in our economic life. Security is something all of us desire in a variety of ways. We have health insurance, life insurance, home insurance, we all want to be protected and secure, even as a nation. The security we now have in our airports and on our military bases is, is more than we've ever had in our history. The topic of border security is most likely going to be one of the major issues when it comes to this year's elections. Now, I suppose it's also possible to become overzealous about security to the point where it keeps one from ever wanting to take a risk. Self-security is not intended to be at the top of the list in setting one's own list of values. A lot of heroes would have never walked across the pages of history. A lot of great things would have never been done if one's own safety were the only criterion to be considered. The early apostles, for example, surely thought that there were other priorities that came first. The passage we read today, taken from the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, is one of many passages in the Bible that touches on the subject of security and puts it in a spiritual context. It comes near the end of Jesus' ministry, at a time when those who were following needed to make a decision about who he was and what his life and teachings were all about, and whether or not they would continue to follow. Jesus says, or John says it was the Feast of Dedication. It was winter, he says, and Jesus was walking in the temple. Now, in John's Gospel, it's worth noting that we often find details that give us insights into things that go beyond the surface of what's being said. For example, when John talks about darkness and light, he's more often than not alluding not only to the physical conditions, but to the spiritual realities. The same thing when he says it was winter. There was a spiritual chill in the air. There was an uneasiness, a discontent, a feeling among the people of not liking what was happening. And it was apparent. John says it was winter, and Jesus was in the temple. And he says the people wanted to know, where is this all going, and what could they expect? And so they asked him. They said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, then tell us plainly. Now, in Jesus' day, that was not only a big question, it was the big question. For the Jews, their whole national history, the, 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 the sum total of their religion was centered around finding an answer to it. They were waiting for the Savior, longing for the Messiah to come, and so they said, who are you? They said, if you are the Christ, then don't keep us guessing any longer. Now, before going any further here this morning, if nothing else to their credit, we'd have to say that at least the people in Jesus' day were asking the right question. Many people in our day go all the way through life and not only fail to find answers, but never even ask the questions. If the central question is, who is this Jesus? A lot of people today don't even ask questions that are peripheral questions about life and the meaning of life, questions about who we are and why we're here, questions about the character and content of our morality. Does it matter? Does it make a difference? Is there a God? And if there is, what does that mean for my life? 
Now, some would say those answers can't be found. Others would say it doesn't really matter. Still others, probably more than we realize, are too busy filling their lives with all kinds of pursuits that finally lead to a dead end. And so they never even ask. Who is this Jesus? That's the question they asked. And that's the question every one of us here today today needs to ask and answer for ourselves. Is he really the Son of God? Did he really, is he really the one sent to save us from our sin? Did he really die on a cross and come back to life? And if he did, then what does that mean for your life and for mine? If you remember the story, Jesus said, I did tell you, but you did not believe. He said, he said, the miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Now, we're talking today about security, about being at peace and secure in this life. Let's talk for a minute about what it means to be one of Jesus' sheep, about belonging to the shepherd, because there's a big difference between knowing who Jesus is and following him as one of his sheep. I read an article not long ago that was talking about the characteristics of sheep, right? This is is nothing new, right? You know this. Sheep are not the smartest animals in the world. They're not independent or creative. They're not brave or even together able to do of much of any value. And they have a tendency to wander off and do their own thing, more often than not oblivious to what's happening around them. The writer of this article said they usually nibble themselves lost. I like that description. They nibble themselves lost. They go from one tuft of grass to another until when they finally look up, they've lost their way. I read the article and I thought, no wonder Jesus compares us to sheep. Nibbling our way through life, a little of this, a little of that, without paying attention, before we know it, we're lost. I hate the comparison. There's nothing flattering about about sheep, but it's true. And it's happening all around us. You don't have to be a pastor or a bishop to see how confused in this world many people are. But there are two characteristics of sheep that are good. And Jesus mentions both of them in the story. One is that the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. When the shepherd calls, they recognize the voice. They hear it, it gets their attention, and they perk up. And two... They not only recognize it and listen, but they follow. In fact, sheep will follow nothing else. Any other voice besides that of the shepherd, and they either stand there doing nothing, or they scatter and run away. But not when the shepherd calls. When the shepherd calls, they recognize his voice, and when they recognize his voice, they listen to what he says, and they follow. Now take that comparison to sheep and apply it to your life. And then ask yourself, what do you think? Are you listening to the voice of the shepherd? Are you following in your life where the shepherd leads? Or are you nibbling your way through life, wandering aimlessly without direction from one voice to the next? I'm not suggesting you are or you aren't. I'm only asking the question. I hear people that they give their critiques of the Christian faith and life. They say things like, it's too narrow, or it's too confining, or it doesn't allow me the freedom to do and say in life the things I want to do and say. You know, maybe maybe it is. Maybe it is. Uh, After all, Jesus did say the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it by by it are many, but the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. They might be right. So what do they do? They go off and do and say in life whatever they want to do and say in life. And, and, and in doing so, they follow the voices they hear. And in the process, they talk about, about being spiritual, seeking to build something between themselves and God that makes them feel good. Do you know what? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It always comes up empty. And how come? Because it ignores the truth. It ignores the truth because it's built on a reality that isn't real. 
Because the truth is, there is a shepherd, and his name is Jesus. And we are sheep, and we do get lost. And until we learn to listen and to follow, we always will. There is no greater security in life than belonging to the shepherd and knowing you are one of his sheep. There's no greater security in your life than listening to his voice and following where he leads. I've been doing this pastoring thing in congregations and now in our denomination going on 38 years. The word pastor means shepherd. It comes from a Latin word that means one who feeds. You might remember one of the last words Jesus said to Peter was, feed my sheep. A pastor's job is to feed the flock and point them to Jesus. Do you know what I've seen in the, those nearly 38 years of being a pastor? What I've learned from watching the sheep? It's not the only thing but going on in the story, and it's certainly not the only thing I've learned, but most sheep, most people, what they want more than anything is to know that the shepherd cares, to know that, that he knows their name and that he knows what's happening in their life. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. And then he says, I know them and they follow. And I give them eternal life and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I still remember the story, maybe you've heard it, of the census taker. You heard that story? Who was was making his way up and down the street? As he came to one house, there was a woman in the front yard doing some gardening. As he approached her, he said, lady, I'm taking the census. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Is that all right? She said, sure, go ahead. She, he said, how many people are living in your house? She said, well, the woman, the woman started naming them. She said, well, there, there's Marcia and Dougie and Amy and Patrick and Philip and Susie. Before she could finish, he interrupted. He said, never mind the names. He said, just give me the number. Well, that's when the woman stood up and, he, and said, my friend, <laughs> I'll have you know that we have quite the number of children in this house. If you want to count them, that's up to you. But we're not into counting and numbering our children. All I can do is tell you their names. My friends, there's no greater security in life than being known by the shepherd. There's no greater security in your life than knowing that you are known by name. That's what Jesus said. Did you hear that? He doesn't say that the sheep follow him because they know him. He says the sheep follow because he knows them. He knows them. Did you know that? I trust you do. Jesus knows your life. He knows what's happening in your life. The challenges you face, the troubles you're facing. He knows your worries and your anxieties and your fears. And he loves you. He knows your life and he loves what he knows. Now, it's interesting that Jesus never says that the sheep will be, will be free from harm. He doesn't say that. You probably noticed that in your own life. You probably, know, you probably lived that in your 150 years as a congregation. He says they listen and they follow, and he knows them by name, gives them eternal life. He doesn't say they'll be free from harm. What he says is that he'll always be there, Emmanuel, God with us, like we sang the name of the congregation, right? And that, that when all is said and done, his sheep will belong to him. It's like the mother who had eight children, who was asked if she had any favorites. Eight children, I have any favorites. She said, yes, I have favorites. My favorite is the one who is sick until he's well again. My favorite is the one who's in trouble until she's safe again. My favorite is the one who's the farthest away from home until he makes his way back. My friends, that's how it is with God. That's how it is with your life. Jesus knows your life. He knows your name. He's there and he cares so much so that he went all the way to the cross. And you might even be one of his favorites especially if you're going through something right now that is troubling in your life. So let me close with this. On this weekend of the celebration of your 150th anniversary, on this first Sunday following the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, you know, it's interesting when it comes to security, to ultimate security, how most people think about that, that matter, that's something that matters and happens when we die, Right? When I die, I think, I mean, in Jesus, then I'll be secure. When my life in this insecure 
world comes to a close, that's when I'll know what security actually is. On the one hand, that's true. When we die and go to heaven, we will experience the security in Christ that we will never in this life fully know. The unseen will become seen. The invisible will become visible. On the one hand, it's true and it's right. But when Jesus speaks of security and eternal life, he doesn't think about only what's going to happen when we die. Rather, he frames what he says with what can and will happen even as we live. Think back to his prayer in the garden, not long before he went to the cross. Jesus prayed that his followers would come to know eternal life. In praying to his father, he prayed, this is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In other words, Jesus redefines eternal life from being that which which happens only when we die to that which is already happening even as we live. Knowing God and knowing Jesus, that's eternal life. It's the beginning of a life that never ends. It's a start to a life that never stops. You see, once you come to know Jesus, understand that he is your shepherd, respond in faith to his voice, you're in eternity. You've already begun a life that will go on forever. And because it's going to go on forever, it changes the way you think about it and approach it, even now. And that doesn't mean, as we've already said, that everything falls neatly into place once you're a Christian. I've lived as one of his sheep for far too long to know that such is not the case. The struggles of this life are still struggles, and the hurts and pains of this life still hurt and cause pain, even for the Christian. But the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It turns doubts into faith. It reminds us that we have a shepherd who cares And it gives to us in him a security that will not go away or change with time, but one that is true security in life and in death for 150 years and beyond when everything else in life is insecure. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand together and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that he has seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Pastor Liam.
Almighty and merciful God, through our Lord Jesus, you have made us your sheep and have become our shepherd. No one can snatch us out of your hand. Generation after generation, you have made your own. And for all this, we thank you. We praise and glorify you, and we ask that you would continue to do this among us, that you would bring new sheep into your fold under one shepherd. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our world, which so often seems bent on removing or obscuring every reference to you, that you would lead it to peace, that you would cause many to turn to our Lord Jesus Christ in prayer, and that when they so pray to you, that you would forgive and hear. Lord, in your mercy. In your this congregation has seen many national and world leaders come and go, and has continued to pray for them. We pray for those who are in office now, that you would give them wisdom and insight, that you would give them courage and strength, but most of all, that you would lead them in the way that you would have them go. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the sick and the suffering among us, especially those whom we name before you now, either aloud or silently in our hearts. Have mercy upon them, comfort them with the knowledge of you, and heal them in accordance with your will. Lord, in your mercy, in your we pray for our congregation, Emmanuel Lutheran Church, that upon this, our 150th, 150th anniversary, you would continue to strengthen our faith and keep us firm in your word for many more generations to come. Lord, in your mercy, in we thank you for the example set for us by our forebearers in faith. Keep us united with them in the one true faith until the day in which you likewise call us home. Lord, in your mercy, in into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. They share a sign of peace with one another.
Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of our Lord, for he is the true Passover lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who by his death has destroyed death and by his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with the living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so we pray as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in faith unto life everlasting. Amen. This praise to Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.